Okay, thanks, Gil. Hello, everybody. Yes, uh, I'm Danny Rawlack. I'm the president of the, we call it the Sturt Upper Reaches Landcare Group, which doesn't flow as well as Upper Sturt Landcare Group, but so it's the upper reaches of the Sturt River. So it's part of the Sturt River where it starts, really, it's just coming down from Crafus and Stirling, comes down through Crafus West, uh, then to Ironbank, then to Upper Sturt. If anybody knows Glenalter and Hawthorne Dean, that's where the housing really starts in earnest. But so we're really above the housing bits and going up to Cravers and Stirling. So it's a relatively small area geographically. Uh, on the northern side, there's Belair National Park. On the southern side, going down the hill, we've got Iron Bank, which is a small part of the world. And then a bit further south, we've got Scott Creek. Scott Creek Conservation Park in Mount Bold. And uh, I've been president of that group since about 2012, so it's about 10 years. Um, I happened into that, to, into contact with the group because I have got a business during the day, my day job doing bush care, and we were trying to track down invasive weed in the Sturt River as part of what we were doing. So I went along to the land here group to tell them about it and then got involved with the group. Um, and I've got to say, tonight during the talk, um, I talk about Bandicoots, I talk about the project, the Bandicoot Superhighway, and a bit about what our group does. Uh, if you've got any questions or you'd like more information along the way, just sing out as we go. It's probably as good as saving it for the end. So I'm quite happy to, to have a discussion as we go. There we go. There's a bandicoot. Has anybody seen a bandicoot? A few people have. Probably seen them in Cleveland, you see them in Blair. Uh, Friends of Scott Creek, they, they're trying to bring back the habitat there and, and help the bandicoots recover there from the fire because they did get knocked a fair bit. But where we are in Upper Sturt is there's a fair population of them there. There's a bit of a mother load in Belair National Park. Um, there's quite a few in Mark Oliphant Conservation Park. There's quite a lot down in Scott Creek. In our area in between, we've got mixed land use, so we don't have as much natural vegetation as we would have in Belair or in Scott Creek. But we've actually got quite a bit. We've got about 40% what we call remnant native vegetation in that area. Is that me? Yeah, I think it is. Okay. I can't tell you how to I'll fix try it. Try and get it further <laughs> away. Um, so there's a lot of natural vegetation left there. It's in fairly good condition. And there's quite a few rare plants and quite a lot of dense vegetation, which is what bandicoots need. As you can see, they're, they're a fairly small creature. They're about the size of... Would anyone tell me what size they are? Yep, about the AB. So about the size of a small cat, or you know, a large kitten, a half-grown cat or something, or a rabbit, or that sort of size. The smaller ones, some people can say, well, it looked like a rat, if it's really small, but they're a bit cuter than rats, at least we like to think they are. Um, and I'll, as we go through, I'll show you some of the features so that you can learn you know, how they might differ in appearance from a rat or something else, rabbit or whatever. Often you will see a fleeting glimpse of these things as it crosses the road or whatever, and you're not really sure what it is. So if you've got a bit of an idea, it might help you to understand. Anyway, um, that first slide, the Bandicoot Superhighway Project. We've developed a project which is designed to help uh, Bandicoots to survive. They are an nationally endangered animal, so they are under threat of extinction if things don't go right for them. So our project is called the Bandicoot Superhighway Project. We don't really like the word superhighway. But we managed to get funding from an organisation that really likes the word, so we've, we've agreed to use it. Superhighway, you know, it sounds fairly linear and hard and constructed and all that sort of thing. Whereas really we're talking about habitat in the bush, which is anything but linear and hard and straight. So, but it, gives, it gets people interested and it gives them the concept of you trying to connect things up, which is what we're trying to do. Uh, a little bit about our group. Just various photos there, people doing things up the top left, we've got people doing some revegetation. Next one in on the top, we've got a talk in the Hall of Upper Sturt. So does anyone know the Hall of Upper Sturt? A few people might have gone past it on Upper Sturt Road. Belongs to the it's a soldiers memorial hall, belongs to that committee. We work very closely with them on a number of things. They let us use the hall. We have two or three talks here a year on nature related subjects. Has anybody been to one? A few of you. I don't know if we've had one on butterflies actually. That might be a, a good thing to, to pop in. 
Um, we've had frogs, we had Mike Tyler, the frog guy, come and do that. We've had bandicoots a few years ago, Jasmine Packer did that. So we've had bats, Terry Reardon from the museum did that. So we have various nature-related subjects, things on weed control for local landholders, making decisions about whether to clear out your blackberry or whether it's actually being used by creatures. Native creatures don't have enough natural habitat, things like that. So things that are both interesting and useful. Uh, the picture in the middle is putting up a camera on a tree at the, our land care site, demonstration site, to really monitor a nesting box. Um, we have a, do have a site next to the hall at Upper Sturt, which is, we call the demonstration site. It's to demonstrate bringing back the bush from a degraded site. And um, if I've got a slide on that, we might talk further about that. Various things we do, carry out on-ground works to retain and improve biodiversity. Often that comes down to weed control, which is usually the most useful thing you can do. Uh, get rid of the weeds, encourage the native flora to come back and provide suitable habitats. Uh, one of the reasons for that, and you might be aware of this with, with butterflies, is that you, you need the right food source for the right creature. And if you have a thicket of weeds, it doesn't attract the same insect life as its own little microclimate, its own little environment really, and it doesn't have the diversity of things in it that needs to support native life, whether it's a butterfly or a lizard or a bandicoot or a bird. So really taking out weeds and, and encouraging natives to come back and take their places is really the most important thing that we can do. Provide advice and resources to landholders. So if someone contacts a group and says, look, I don't know what to do about this issue, I've got this weed taking over my bush, or I think I've got bandicoot, should I keep clearing my weeds or not? Various things like that. We'll provide advice, we'll come, go out to people's properties, have a look, uh, have a chat with them, give them some options. If it's useful, refer them, thank you, <laughs> refer them to the to the uh, local landscape board and the ecologist in the board who might come out and give them advice, that sort of thing. Help build capacity in the local community. The talks we give helps to do that so people learn more, they know more, and they're more empowered to be able to do some stuff themselves. And we do work with local schools. The Landcare Group was formed uh, somewhere around 2000, I think maybe a little bit before that. And everybody on the committee happened to have a child at the local school, the Upper Sturt Primary School. And we still meet, have our committee meetings in the, in the school. So we do things with schools, like have the school come to our demonstration site once a year and have a planting day. We might have a speaker go to the school and talk about biodiversity or about bandicoots or whatever. Uh, at the moment we're talking to them about their heritage bushland. They've got a lot of bushland under a heritage agreement. They're wondering how they can use that better with the kids there, to the ed education of the kids. We have a lot of their classes outdoors. But also they want to balance it out so the kids aren't trampling through the bush and wrecking it. So we're helping them with that. So that, that's a bit of a roundup of what we do. Um, when we have talks in the hall, we usually try and get an article in the Courier newspaper in the hills or the Weekender Herald, sometimes in the advertiser, to attract people to the talks. Um, because of that, we have a bit of a profile. People know about the group, so people often come to us to to find out what's going on with various things. That's just a slide from the public talks. Somebody over at the front there. That's the demonstration site. That's right next to the hall at Upper Sturt. So people know the hall. If you're driving past and you've got time, you stop, pop into the car park there and you can just walk down off the car park. And there's a path down into an area of bushland there. So uh, that area of bush, it, does, it belongs to the whole committee as well, and so we're there with their blessing. And that was originally full of blackberry and broom, and still bandicoots in it. Is there a street address? Yes, it's a corner of Upper Sturt Road. It's, I think it's 173 Upper Sturt Road, but it's a corner of Upper Sturt Road and Sturt Valley Road. So it's on an intersection. So you've got to be careful going in and out of the car park because of that. There's a bit of a blind corner as well. Um, yes, yeah, so as the path goes down there, there's a bench at the end that you can sit on and commune with nature or watch, watch birds or whatever. And what happened, the Landcare Group, when it was formed, decided they wanted to have a, what they call a demonstration site to demonstrate 
weed removal, bringing back the bush, not, not taking weeds out wholesale so that you've got no habitat left at all, things like that. So they adopted this site and they gradually, I wasn't involved back at the beginning, but they gradually took away weeds bit by bit in what is called a minimal disturbance approach. So you're not clearing a whole lot all at once, you're clearing a little bit and then as weeds might come back in the bits you've cleared, you control those and you also might have some natives coming up so you protect those and you do it gradually. So in theory, you're doing it at a pace that the bush can recover rather than clearing it all at once. If you clear it all at once, what happens is, say for example, it's broom. People know broom as a weed, yeah. You'll get thickets of that. You clear it all out and what's going to happen? Something will take its place. What's going to take its place? Probably the number one candidate is more broom. So you get broom seed leaves coming up everywhere. Thousands and thousands of them. So you've created a lot of work for yourself in effect. So you've got to have the resources to do that follow up if you do a big lot of work. Best thing to do if you don't have a lot of resources, do a little bit, monitor that, follow up on it. Um, so that's what they did with this. And it was to demonstrate that you can bring back the bush in an area which has got a whole lot of weeds. You can do that successfully. You can, you know, nature will regenerate quite well if you take away the competition in most cases. Most of the time we, we say you don't need to plant trees because they will come up. That depends a bit on the grazing pressure as well because you will get um, increasing numbers of kangaroos and we've probably all observed that there's more kangaroos around these days. So that's a couple of pictures from the demonstration site. I don't know if there's any more on here. Well, that's one thing we did at Upper Sturt. We've got a, anyone knows Hilltop Drive? It's quite near the shop at Upper Sturt. That's a, a dead end road that runs along the crest of a hill. All the land that people, the houses are at the top, all their land goes down on either side of the hill to a watercourse. All those properties have got fantastic bush. Most of them have got bandicoots and other rare creatures. So we've been trying to get them all together to form a bit of a, an active group where they support each other. They might be working bees on each other's properties. They exchange information. Uh, they learn about things. Here we had a, a bit of a forum so they could learn about weeds and weed control. So that, that was an understood. Revegetation, that's part of the picture as well. This is, um, does anyone know Woolly Butt Road? Iron Bank Road? Um, what else? I'm just trying to think. Does anyone know the old, what I call the old car graveyard? In, in, yeah, it's just near that. They, you can, what we're looking at there is a piece of agricultural land where they normally have goats, uh, specialised goats and some sheep. And the landholder there, Kath, is very environmentally minded and we wanted to bridge from where the photo was taken from, which is bushland, down through this um, agricultural land to the Surt River, which is in the background down there. So we know that bandicoots move along the watercourse quite successfully. They do quite like that sort of damp soil for foraging in and it gives them cover as well because there's often blackberries down by the water and the blackberries protect them fairly well. Where we're standing from is a strip of bushland and very close to that we've got Mark Oliver Conservation Park behind us. So we know there's bandicoots at Mark Oliver Conservation Park, there's bandicoots down by the river, but from genetic studies we know that a lot of these bunches of bandicoots aren't connected genetically, so they've they become disconnected. They're not so healthy because they're not breeding with other populations. Some of them are getting inbred. The ones in Belair are getting inbred. They're not breeding with, with other populations. So here we've decided, let's see if we can revegetate between these two bits of bushland to provide them a bit of protective cover so they can move from one area to another. Bandicoots can meet each other and do their thing and become more diverse genetically. So this is a bunch of students from Urbay High School who came to revegetate. You can't see a lot in that, but down in the background, and I don't have a pointer, but um, in this bit here, there's a lot of tree guards and a lot of vegetation going on down in there. And so the, the farmer agreed to have that fenced off, and we used Green Army volunteers originally to do that planting. And we, we every now and again, we do another planting exercise, and we thicken that up even more. Uh, the brown bits in there, a lot of that is blackberry. There was there's blackberry out on the hillsides as well, but the sheep and goats keep that down. When we fenced that off to do the revegetation to keep out kangaroos and other grazing, it also stopped things grazing on the blackberries. So the blackberries got bunter. So we've got a lot of blackberry in there and their native plants as well. So we've really got to make a decision now how we manage that. 
do we take out all that blackberry and, and just rely on the natives we're planting? Do we keep some blackberry and some plants? You know, do we let it all go to blackberry because it actually does provide protective habitat for bandicoots, but at the expense of the native vegetation? So, um, publications. I didn't mention that before, but we've put out. Uh, we're working on a third one. First one: frogs, reptiles, and mammals, and how to restore their habitat. That's creatures that you'll find in the southern Mount Lofty Ranges and fungi, some of the basic fungi that you find as well. Um, the one that we're putting out shortly is about the local flora. Now, getting closer to talking about bandicoots, this bandicoot superhighway began with something called Ollie Bell, which comes, the Ollie comes from elephant and the bell comes from Belair. So the idea of connecting up those, those two parks and working on the vegetation in between. And up until that point, our experience of what work people had done in the bush or the near hills has been, you know, Joe over the fences just has found out that the landscape board has got some funding, so he applies to them for some funding. They come and have a look at his property, say, yeah, okay, we'll give you $2,000 towards weed control if you put it in kind or something. So it's been, very much on a property by property basis, depending on interest and what the landscape board or the previous NRM board or the council or whoever's got money has decided they might want to fund. We thought it'd be really good to take a landscape scale approach. So we're looking at that whole area, looking at the habitat in that whole area, what creatures are in there, what really needs to be done to make the habitat better in that area. And we found that because bandicoots are a fairly identifiable animal and they're fairly cute, and they're endangered, we can use them to get attention and we can focus our project on bandicoots. It's a worthy thing to focus on in itself, bandicoots, but by doing things to help bandicoots, we're really helping most of the biodiversity. To help bandicoots, um, and I might cover this also, I'm not sure on the slides yet, but they need, uh, they're little creatures and they scurry and run around like a, you know, a cat or a rabbit or something would. So if a fox or something is chasing them, they're going to get got unless they've got something to get into that that creature can't get hold of. So that's why blackberry is good. But before we had blackberry in this country, what protected them? Well, we didn't have foxes either then, but we might have had you know, thylacines or dingoes or whatever that might have chased them instead. So they would have had thick native vegetation. So the general idea is that anything sort of knee, knee high and below that's dense and hard to walk through is good habitat for bandicoots. But that's also good habitat, generally speaking, for butterflies, for lizards, for all sorts of insects and grubs, for other small mammals, for your small birds. Lots of things really benefit from that. And normally when you're creating that, you don't just create a whole lot of low, low understory, you're creating a range of stories as well, so that benefits the other creatures that go up higher, like your butterflies and birds and things as well. So the bandicoot is a really handy thing for us to have. Um, and being nationally endangered, it's really worth trying to improve things for the bandicoot just on its own anyway. Um, so we're in the early stages of that Ollie Bell thing. We did, it was on the end of the last slide, we had assistance from the local NRM board as it was at the time. The district officer and the ecologist from the local area would often meet with us and we'd work out what we could do, what funding they had, what funding we had, where it's best targeted, that sort of thing. Um, we sought funding for very small grants, Council and NRM. NRM funded a survey, so they found, I think it was a bit over $10,000, and this is going back seven or eight years, to do surveys on some of the really, um, what we thought were some of the better properties in our area. Sorry, just a bit better because I'm trying to film oh, okay. your, your, your dot. Yeah, people better. still Thank see you. Right. But Thank yeah. you. So they, they did what we call uh, baseline flora and fauna surveys. So it's basically going in and documenting what is there. So that gives you a picture of what you've got to start off with. So you've then got something to compare with five years later, ten years later, whatever down the track in terms of um, your numbers of different species and so on. It also gives you an idea of where it's worth doing the work, if you can do work. So they funded surveys, we funded some as well, we funded them, they did about 11 or 12, we found some money to do about another 7. The NRM genetic study at the bottom there, that's what I was mentioning before, where they found out that populations in different areas are genetically diverse, and so they're not interbreeding as much, 
as they really need to, to, to remain really healthy. Olibill morphs into the Bandicoot Superhighway. What happened there? I'm not sure. Probably um, try to make a short story of it. We found out about an organisation called the Foundation for National Parks and Wildlife, which doesn't have a big profile here. Has anybody heard of them? Maybe they, they're starting to get a bit of a profile. They're based in New South Wales, but they operate Australia-wide. They had funded a little bit of work with the <coughs> Friends of Warrabinda Bushland Reserves at Stirling. And the president of that group forwarded an email to me from the foundation saying, next thing, thanks, thanks for you know, this little project we've been doing with you, next thing we'd like to do is the Bandicoot Superhighway. And the president sent that to me and said, I think this is more, more your cup of tea. And the Bandicoot Superhighway wasn't really a concept at that time. It was a headline in a newspaper article. And if you've ever done a story with a journalist, they love something they can grab and make into a catchy headline. We'd had a story in, I think it was a Mitchum local paper. And we were talking about connecting up habitat and the journalist decided to call it Bandicoot Superhighway. And the head of the Department for the Environment here saw the story and it stuck in her brain. So when the the Chief Executive of the Foundation for National Parks and Wildlife went to her and said, I want to do a project in South Australia that has got some scale to it and has got an endangered species involved. She said, Bandicoot Superhighway. So that's, that's how we got the, the term and how the whole thing really started. So we arranged a meeting with this foundation. We talked to them, they were quite interested. And you know, we brought in the department as well. So we're partnering with the department so it's a, it's a, it's a, I don't know if it's unique, but it's certainly unusual to have a, a, you know, a not-for-profit bank here group partnering with a phil philanthropic organisation, which is what the foundation is, and a government department mm. within a three-way partnership in a project. So we had various discussions and various things, planning, uh, the foundation funded a, a basic project plan, um, and it, it ends up that they've put in $250,000 to the project, and soon after reaches have found another $250,000 through the federal government. So we were pretty blown away that we managed to get that much funding. We would have liked more because we could do more with more funding, but that's a significant amount of funding to have half a million dollars for a project. So what we've done is we're co-managing it with the, the departments and uh, Green Web, that's the first bit. The friends there's a lot of acronyms up there. There's a prize for anybody who knows what they all mean. <laughs> um, the very first one, FWBR, Friends of Warrabinda Bushland Reserves. That's the president who contacted me. Green Web is a loose affiliation of groups in the Central Hills area that are all working in the environment. So this is just a tangent, but Friends of Mark Oliphant there, Friends of Scott Creek, Orgate Valley Land Care Group, National Trust in South Australia, Trees for Life. Adelaide Hills Council, Department of Environment and Water, Stood Up Reaches Land Care Group, Friends of Mark Oliphant Conservation Park, Friends of Mylor Bushland, Arbury Park Outdoor School, Denary Land Care Group. So it's, it's a really good group. It doesn't have any, it's not incorporated or anything. We just get together and meet and talk and update each other about what's going on and say, so isn't it terrible about foxes? What can we do? You know? And someone might say, why don't we write a letter to the minister or whatever? Or, or I know so and so, let's look into these traps or... Uh, it's just a very good group. Anyway, out, out of the green web and my contact with that person, we've got this contact with the foundation. That's their logo on the right with the koala. Um, Rebecca Sharkey's office, that's... The help for Rebecca Sharkey's office is what led to us getting the $250,000 from the federal government. Um, her office put out, this is February 2019, an email saying, Dear community groups in my electorate, um, I'm looking to lobby the federal government for some money to help support our community. Have you got anything that needs doing? Do you need new lights on your football stadium? Do you need a new toilet? Do you need a projector for your meetings, etc.? So uh, we had a very capable member of our committee at that time who liaised with Sharkey's office and found someone in the office who was quite interested and they worked together put together a 10 or 12 page document uh, with a wish list budget of $250,000, submitted it, we didn't hear anything back, forgot about it. That was February 2019. 
in October 2020, I got an email saying from Sharky's office saying, stand by, you're about to receive $250,000. And I nearly fell over. <laughs> but I'd forgotten completely about it and never thought we'd get it. So that, that was really wonderful funding. And, and we've always done things like that, even when it doesn't seem likely, we'll sort of push for something and see what chance we've got of getting it. Um, that's just from, I don't know how well you can see that. Thanks to my, the beginning, $250,000 grants. Uh, that's the sort of scene, that's some more things, people planting and looking at the camera. Code delivery through a variety of organisations. So down the bottom we've got Nature Conservation Society on the left, we've got Stood Up Reaches Land here with that Act of Australia with the hands, Australian Government, the grants, Landscapes, Hills and Fleury and the Foundation. Um, so the Stood Up Reaches, we're administering $250,000 of the money and the Landscape Board's administering the other $250,000, but we have a, a joint steering group and we make joint decisions about what we're doing. They don't say, oh, we're going to do this, and we say, we're going to do that. They, you know, they say, well, we've, in our, in our $250,000, we have to have a planting day, you know, and plant 10,000 plants. Where do you think we should do it? You know, we get together, we talk about that, and we plan it and strategize it. They might do most of the organizing, but we work very much together. Um, Nature Conservation Society, because we're all volunteers, we thought, well, we, we don't really have the capacity to run $250,000 grant ourselves, you know, to engage contractors to do weed control, to supervise them, to manage them, to knock on property owners' doors and see what if we can get onto their property to have a look at what's there and prioritise where we do things and run community engagement events and all that. We can do some of that, but not all of it. So what we did is we did a, a process where we interviewed various not-for-profit organisations that could deliver the sorts of things that we needed. We had Trees for Life in there, Nature Conservation Society, Nature Glenel Trust. Um, there's, there's a few others, Cons Conservation Council South Australia, and a couple more. And we end up settling on the Nature Conservation Society of SA. And we're very pleased with what they're doing. Uh, we're also partnering with the University of Adelaide, and some of you, I think Lionel mentioned Jasmine Packer, some of the others may have heard of Jasmine. Jasmine's has been doing research and activities with bandicoots for quite some time. So she's on, on the um, steering group for this as well. So University of Adelaide is represented. Friends of Parks, we have a representative, Peter Watton, if anybody knows him, on our group as well. That's just another slide showing lots of different things, the revenge and that gathering. There's a very cute little bandicoot. Um, the, like, the ecologist Luke Price took that photo, it's a very beautiful little baby. So, a summary of things, community working together to protect and connect bandicoot populations in the Mount Lofty region. Initially the projects, um, we were very ambitious, we had to sort of cut our ambitions back because we were producing one hundred million dollars and we got 500,000 so um, we still did a lot with 500,000 but we thought, where are bandicoots in South Australia and what are we going to have to do to improve the overall status of the bandicoot? Early on we identified an aim of improving the status from endangered to vulnerable. So vulnerable is not as bad as endangered. Um, we thought, fantastic, that's a great aim to go for. Then we unpacked that a bit and thought, okay, what do we have to actually do? And, and that status of endangered is determined by the International Un Union for Conservation of Nature, IUCN, uh, which determines the status, conservation status of all sorts of living creatures. And it turns out it's measured over the whole area of the Southern Mount Lofty Raiders where bandicoots have historically been recorded, which is from Deep Creek up to Kersbrook. So do we have the resources to run a project over that? <laughs> that area of land and to make a difference over that area of land enough to improve the status. Well, we, we thought we'd try, which is why we aim for a million dollars budget. Mm. And so we, sat, we thought we'd, we'd do that with three initial pilot projects. One in our upper Sturt and Iambank area where we already operate because we've got <coughs> some experience with doing things to help bandicoots. We'll do another one down Kersbrook, Kuiper area where there is some activity going on. Uh, one of the ecologists from the Landscape Board has been down there 
uh, working with schools and various things on bandicoots. And there's some interest down in the Maiponga area. There, there's some little bit of sign of bandicoots there and a few groups and individuals interested as well. So we plotted out three pilots. We've ended up basically doing the main one um, in the Ironback Upper Sturt area, but doing a bit of outreach as well. So we're probably going to help set up groups, not set up groups, but bring together groups in the Maiponga area, put people in touch with each other, maybe um, help people with a bit of the experience that we've got, you know, so that they can work out what they're doing um, down there and prioritise things and so on. Um, but also going around and talking to lots of different groups in lots of different areas, so it's really spreading the message fairly wide. Some other things will happen organically because of that, some other things we might be able to help encourage or foster along the way. And we're looking at the project not as just something, you know, we've got two years funding. It finishes at the end of two years. We're going to try very hard to get ongoing funding so it's an ongoing project and it doesn't really have an end. You know, at least a 10 year project anyway. So, um, so that's... What are we about? It's a pilot. We listen, we test, we learn, we adapt, we keep working towards our goals. So we've got very much that adaptive sort of approach. We're not coming in and saying we know everything, this is what we need to do. Uh, we do know some things because of what our experience and, and because of the general knowledge that's out there. Uh, but we are always listening to other people's experiences, finding out things, testing out different things. We can probably be doing some tests on the proper, you know, not the proper way, but the best way to control foxes and, and looking in, into that. That's probably one of the main threats to bandicoots, foxes and cats. But predominantly foxes. Um, other testing, we've employed cameras, and this might come up further, to sort of find out where bandicoots are, where they're not, what else we're seeing in the images. You know, we're seeing probably for every couple of bandicoots, we might be seeing 15 foxes, for example, pretty worrying. But we're also seeing deer and rats and various other things, so that's quite instructive. Um, so that really helps inform what you do and where you do things. Some background, you see the map on the right, that's uh, historic bandicoot records, so you see right down the bottom, which is down in your deep creek area, right down to the coast pretty much. The big dense area around Adelaide in the middle there is your Clearland and Sturt Upper Reaches, Belair National Park, Mark Oliphant and Scott Creek. That's sort of all a bit blurred into one, so you can see there's, you know, those areas you can make distinctions between them, but there's bandicoots in between. And in our area, I was starting to say before, we've got fairly mixed land use, so you might drive through some of the side roads down Pole Road or whatever, and you'll see there's an empty paddock, or, and there's some, nothing seems to be happening. There's a bit of bush that looks really scrappy. There's some really good bush. There's a couple of houses together, etc. So you've got a whole lot of different use, and you'll find in the um, less vegetated parts, you'll still find bandicoots. Some say, oh yeah, there's some in my wood heap, or so-and-so's got them down the back fence in the scrappy part of their garden, etc. So they're still around the place and surviving, just probably not in the numbers that we'd like. Historically uh, records from Williamstown to Deep Creek Conservation Park occur in a range of habitats but require a dense understory. Having said that, they're fairly adaptive or adaptable, like I was saying, you know, rubbish heaps and things like that. that I termed the old car graveyard, used to have bandicoots nesting under some of the old car bodies. So and I know some of them have been under his shed, they're nesting in periwinkle in his garden, stuff like that. So, uh, range of threats to their survival across the landscape. Um, in terms of threats, um, foxes and feral cats are probably the biggest one. Fragmentation of the habitat's a big one. So, you get little pockets of them here and there because us human beings, we clear stuff out. We create roads, we subdivide land, we clear land, etc. So the habitats become quite fragmented, so a lot of our challenge is to connect them up again. Uh, things about the bandicoots, ecosystem engineers, that's a term they like to bandy around these days. You'll see that I think they talked about, what was it, betongs, I think, they're using that term as well pop in and out of the landscape. That means that you might have someone who's got bandicoots on their property and they've been seen down by their creek, they've cut for a couple of years, they go down there and there's no sign of them. 
next year, you know, over the next year there's still no sign of them, next year there's still no sign of them. They, they've either moved on or they've died out or something has happened. They generally live to about four or five years, so it's not a long time. So it's feasible that a population might die out. Also what happens is that uh, as they breed, they'll, they might have three or four in a litter and they'll get kicked out of the nest pretty quickly. As soon as they can fend for themselves, they, they're booted out, off you go. So they're solitary animals, right from the get-go pretty much. Um, the males are territorial, so male gets kicked out of the nest. When Dad doesn't want him around or probably kill him, he doesn't get far enough away and establish his own territory. So you often see pictures of them. If you see a lot of pictures, you'll see nicks in ears and things like that, or a patch on the fur where there's a bit of fur missing because they do fight territorially. Uh, that might be part of the reason for popping in and out of the landscape. It might be that the food source has been exhausted, it might be that they just roam, it might be that predators have got them. We don't know enough to really know that yet. We do know they're endangered nationally. And there used to be eight different species in the Bilby and Bandicoot group in South Australia. The Bandicoot, Southern Brown Bandicoot is the only one that's left. It's Bandicoot, which is a shame. Uh, in terms of identifying them, can people see that clearly enough? They've got a round, big rounded rump, that's similar to what a rabbit might have, and you can't really see very well there, but they've got a, a flat sort of part of the rear foot, which is sort of good for bouncing off, a bit like a rabbit has or a kangaroo has. So they tend to hop a little bit, hop and scurry around. The rounded rump is part of that. The, the front legs are much smaller and shorter. That seems to have disappeared on there. Switch it off and on again. Not me? No, yes. Um, they've got a short tail. I don't know how visible that is, but that's, it's what, one, two, three, about a quarter of the size of the body. Anything that looks similar, but it's not a bandicoot, will have a longer tail. So that's a really good identifying sign, if you can see the tail, if you see it long enough. So it's a short little tail. A rat's tail will be about as long as its body or longer. An eight rat, or an inch, or an And it's hairy, is it? The tail? Yeah. Um, not terribly hairy. I can't get this to go back on. But mm. <laughs> I'll just speak loudly. Uh, I don't think the tail's very hairy. I've, the only time I've, I've actually handled the bandicoot was a dead one we found in Burnside area, which is unusual for Burnside. And that tail wasn't very hairy. But it was a bit mauled, so I don't really know for sure. But it's not a fluffy tail. It's not, a, not an obviously hairy tail. If it's hairy, it's mildly hairy. Um, it's got rounded ears. A long pointed snout is the other sort of fairly identifiable feature. And it uses that, so it's got a good sense of smell. And it eats lots of things above ground, but a lot of things underground as well. It likes grubs, insects, worms, all the spiders, all those sorts of things. So it will use its nose to try and sniff stuff out and it will poke into the ground with its nose, so you get little indents where it's poked in. I should have some slides of those. You can tell on. when you've got them in the garden. Sorry? You can tell when you've got bandicoots yes. in the garden because you get these sort of conical depressions. Yes, definitely. And they've provided Tasmanians with a verb. Have they? Bandicooting. Bandicooting. And bandicooting yeah. is when you're growing potatoes and yes. you want a few little ones, you sort of burrow in round oh, the yes. sides of the hills and pull out, pull out yeah. immature spuds. I got that one from my late father-in-law. Very good, I'll add that into the... Who was a, who was a good yeah. grower of potatoes and various other things, yeah. and also spent a lot of his life in the Tasmanian bush, where yeah. of course the bandicoots got striped bums. Which yes, means there, you don't have to argue about whether they're in <laughs> or not, at least. There's one, I might have a slide of it later, I'm not sure called the Eastern Bard Bandicoot, which is, yeah. I know it's in Victoria, it's probably the yeah. Tasmanian one as well. That's also endangered, but we don't yes. have them over here. And that has got stripes, not really bold stripes, but, but you can very, see them. Oh, they're very identifiable. Yeah, they they're are. They're like a sort of the back end of a mini Tassie tiger, yeah. which you don't see anymore. Yeah. One of the things I found was useful with bandicoots, um, recognising their face, as yeah. in arguing about whether this dead thing is a rat or not. Yeah. A rat has a sort of dished profile, mm. a bandicoot the profile is, of the facial profile is convex. Yeah. But sort of, okay. it's not quite a Roman nose, but yeah. definitely <laughs> curve in the other direction. Yeah. 
I don't know if you can see from there, it's got kind of flicky fur. So it's sort of a darker brown underneath and it's got goldy sort of straw coloured yeah. flecks on the outside. Also they of course have, a, the, the girls have a pouch and often have something in it. They do have a pouch. Do you know which way the pouch faces? It's backward, backwards facing backwards pouch. Yeah. Um, so if they stood up on their hind legs, baby would fall out mm -hmm. by the water, hanging on. Um, that's well designed. <laughs> it's that they, when we get onto digging some things, you'll see pictures, but they dig between their legs. So the dirt goes backwards. So if the pouch was facing the other way, that would like would do it. So, so there's a, re a good reason for it. Moving any further forward, so, as you're saying, it's a conical hole. You can't really tell from that bit that it's conical, but when you see one in real life, well, you, unless, unless it's dark, one, too dark inside, you'll be able view. to see that it is conical. If you put your finger in, you'll feel that it's closing in around your finger towards the end. Um, now usually, those that sort of size is pretty average in terms of the diameter of the hole. And the thing about it, you'll get echidnas that will also do a conic, small conical hole, but echidnas are very fond of doing the thing which I call a kid with a beach, beach spade, you know, just sort of chuck dirt everywhere <laughs> and make a real mess. So if you see uh, some of those and you don't have the messy ones as well, it's probably a bad echid. If you've got messy ones and those, it might just be a echidna. <coughs> and the, yes, the dirt is in a straight line back from the hole. So. You can see it vertical on these. That, that comes back this way. It's not out there or out there. There's a little bit out there, but out there and this one, that's a bit more splayed out than what they normally do, but it's generally a pretty narrow back, pointy hole. And they, the holes, I've seen holes that go straight down, but most of them go in at an angle. Oh, thank you. Okay. Well, turd. Can I just ask? Yep. Rab rabbits, because I'm confused as to whether I've got rabbit candy kids or kidney or all three. Rabbits, rabbits tend to just scratch a very general hole. Rabbits are more like a dish, like a spoon shape, mm -hmm. as a rule. But without the pointy end. Won't have a pointy end and it'll be more shallow. I think I've got all three. Yeah. Rabbit. And it's not uncommon to have, have, a, have a whole range. Um, that one on the left is not very visible. I don't know if anybody can see it from there. You might be able to. That's, that's a hole in there, that's a soil pole coming back there. So they can be a bit hard to spot, so you probably have to stand and look in some cases. The easiest ones are spotted where they end grass or lawns. And they do like to dig in lawns sometimes because they, they like the lawn grubs. So are they carnivorous then? They're carnivorous. Well, they're omnivorous really because they'll eat, also eat small berries and other sort of above ground things as well. Fungus? Sorry? Will they have fungi? Yes, they love fungi. Um, they're particularly known for digging for fungi under the soil. Um, what was I was going to say? They, I've known people to feed them out their back doors and things, which isn't recommended for sort of number of reasonably obvious reasons. But they will eat peanuts and fruit, bits of fruit, and all sorts of things as well. So that they are pretty omnivorous. Um, yes. So you're going to feed them, I guess, get some fishing worms or something fed in with that, it's probably the thing to do. Now, scats. You don't normally see these, scats is what we call the, you know, the droppings. Um, you don't normally see them around very easily. In theory you should, but that'll give you a bit of an idea. They pretty punch above their weight for size. You compare it to a kangaroo or a wallaby or a rat. Um, and the figure on the left with the finger gives you a bit of an idea. Relative size. So they, um, they're, a bit, they're a bit rough, they're not perfectly smooth, um, elongated, adapting to the peri urban landscape. So there's some, what we were talking about before, how they, they can be around habitation and they can get used to people quite well. If they don't feel threatened, they'll, you might see them. Danny, when I was doing the um Trapping with um, Jasmine Packer and Ray Knight, yeah. the bandicoots were very placid. Yes. And they would, you'd think they'd run away from you very quickly, but they don't. They're very slow to return to the bush. Um, Bob Myers up in the top right there, yeah. he's got them up at Mount Pleasant. Yes. And the behaviour is totally different. Those guys are 
very much associated with humans. Yes. And he got bitten by one because it wanted to be fed. So yes. the behaviour is just totally different. Yeah, and I've said that we had a landholder at Upper Sturt who, well, still, I think he's still got some, and he has some in his garden at the back. It looks a bit like that sort of garden there that I can see. It looks like ivy and periwinkle, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And they live in that and under his shed. And though he trained them so that he would feed them, you know, 10, 30 or 11 every day with some peanuts, <laughs> which not good for the bandicoots at all, but really handy if, you know, the minister's coming to visit, <laughs> showing the bandicoot, you know, can you come at 10, 30? <laughs> so, um, and that, that was a bit, that, that top right photo with Bob reminds me of that. We actually, we did story, Channel 2 wanted to do a story, so they set up a camera, just put it on the ground and running there, and then we all walked back and the bandicoots popped out there and, and they you know, had a couple of peanuts in front of the camera and all that sort of thing, so you could manipulate it a bit. They've, we've had footage of them coming in eating people's dog food and cat food through the cat door. Got someone off Sheart Road who says, would you go down and do the garden and come and sit on a foot? But she's got down the back of her yard, she's got a thicket of blackberries, which is probably where they live. So, um, they're, they're fairly, you know, as you say, they can get quite almost domesticated. I've heard that if you trap them and put them in a bag, they don't try and jump out or anything until you, know, you get them close to the top and then they might hop out. Uh, which might be their undoing too when it comes to other creatures that kill them. I Foxes and cats and dogs and the things. The ones that we were looking at were the females with the young. Yeah. And I, I think they were deliberately going slowly back to the bush and not racing back because they might dislodge the young. A bit like birds will do when they yeah. distract you from where their nest is. Yeah. Uh, what is this trying to tell us? I should put my glasses on. I don't know. So part of what we're doing is reviewing and updating Bandicoot records. There's various databases for those, I don't know if anybody here is involved with recording information about um, flora or fauna. We've got the Biological Database of South Australia, which the Department for Environment manages. Uh, we've got the Atlas of Living Australia, which is a federal database. We've got something called iNaturalists, which originally comes from America, but what they're using here, which feeds into the Atlas of Living Australia. We've got something else as well. And so we're looking at all these things and so do they talk to each other? Well, a little bit, but not properly. And sometimes it's one way and not two ways. So it's really, the data's not in a terrific state. It's okay, but it's not terrific. So. We've been looking at what data there is out there. But the other thing is that, um, because I said before, that they, they pop in and out of the habitat. You might have a good record of where they are. Two years' time, that record might not be accurate anymore. It might it'll give you a general idea, though. So, you know, if you've got a whole cluster down at Deep Creek, you're probably still going to have a lot of Deep Creek in two years' time. They might just be in different spots. So what we've got on the left there is, this is information out of the Biological Database of South Australia, and we've got give a bit of an idea, should I have a long stick. The land national park up here, so you can see the population there. Mark Oliphant Conservation Park there. And this is our land care area in between. Now this doesn't have a lot of dots on it. This is only the official records from the biological database. So it's what someone's put in. Um, when I go to a property and people say, oh, we've got bandicoots, and I say, have you put it into the biological database about this living Australia? The answer, 9.5 times out of 10 is no. So there's all these records out there that we don't, and so that aren't represented on any database. The picture on the right, that's a laminated map that we got one of the ecologists to do of our area. The green area is Belair. The red bits of land are where we've done some of those data surveys. And the yellow dots, and there's some red dots there as well, are where people have come to our meetings or whatever and they put a dot down on the map where they've seen bandicoots, where they know bandicoots are. And we cross reference that with the official records and there's virtually no overlap. It's very interesting. So we mostly use th that map as an engagement tool rather than a scientific record. Because someone will say, oh yes, I've got bandicoots and they've seen some diggings, but, they, you know, but have they actually interpreted the diggings correctly? Don't know. Or they've seen something scurrying through the bush. Or was, it some, was it a rabbit that just happened to look a bit like a bandicoot? Um, you need a certain amount of reliability probably to make an official recording. But generally, you'll get a pretty good idea. So you think there's still one population or they're isolated populations? Oh, they're pretty isolated, most of them. In Belair, you've certainly got populations that are 
And you look at the dots in Belair there, I can see what, four, seven, eight dots or something. There's heaps of bandicoots in Belair, they're all over the place. So this one here is Belair, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine dots. But there's, there's whole heaps in, you look at the official record for Belair, there's whole, which up here, there's a really big cluster of them. So there's, this, that's why I said we don't like using it as a scientific thing, because it's more people to dot on and, and they, um, they feel part of, of a community of something that's going on as well and take a bit more interest in perhaps getting yeah, involved. Plans to translocate females. Yes, that's part of what we will do. Um, that's, I'm not a scientist, but apparently it takes quite a bit of preparation to do that. You have to get various permits and do a whole lot of organising. So that's underway at the moment, so that will happen. Yeah, so translocation is part of it. And that's a really good way to get those genetics back happening, cross fertilising. Um, so, yeah, that um, also getting people to put dots on the map. You know, if people say we've got bandicoots, then often I or someone else will go out and have a look as well, or one of the ecologists. So it starts things happening. It might be an intro to some work happening on their property or them getting involved in the project some other way. Uh, improving our knowledge. Now, this is a screenshot of uh, a Bandicoot superhighway portal, which is now active, and I've got to find, I'll find this on my phone, uh, the details of where you go to to get to this. But this is basically something where you or I, if we see Bandicoot crossing the road, we can pull this up and we can put in where we saw it. And so you've got the date and time there, you've got the type of sighting, where you saw the animal, where they saw diggings, whether you saw a nest, whether you saw faeces. Um, and I think there's something else on there where you can upload a photo as well, if you're lucky enough to be able to get a photo. So this is really us trying to do a bit more of a scientific gathering of information. So What's that now. Sorry? What's that? Uh, I'm trying to think of the name, but I think it's, we're just calling it Bandicoot Superhighway Portal. But um, Reese, who's one of the Nature Conservation Society people, has sent it, a leak to me, so I'll just see if I can find that quickly. It's going to be buried back away. Not that one. I think it might be something very simple like www.bsh, which is what we use for Bandicoot Superhighway, dot com. Maybe if someone's got, I've got their phone yeah. going, see if Or if you works. could find a link later on, but I could put it on the website. Yes, I'll certainly, I'll find the link before I go. Yep. Not that one. Yeah, I don't want to waste too much time finding it. Um, yeah, so that's, that's a great, that, and that's taken us a while to develop that. We've actually, part of our $250,000, we've put $5,000 towards IT. And uh, some people think, well, that's a waste. You're not spending it on ground where you're really getting the value for your money. But with the IT, something like this, we're really going to get great value out of. We've also got with something called Salesforce, which I didn't know about, but it's a whiz-bang. Do you know about it? No. 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 Uh, it's a... It's a database platform type thing which it sorts all your information so you can put in Danny Rawlack property at such and such address interested in property visit thinks might have bandicoots or whatever you can put in Danny Rawlack interested in coming to talks not interested in anything else or Danny Wright wants to get involved in the project or whatever and it will put put all this information into different places so you can then manage it so instead of me writing down details on a bit of a pad and taking it home and forgetting to do something with it these people will hear back in the right time when there's something they can get involved in or that, that's of use to them. We want to do a mail out to certain people. We've got the right details for the right people, all that sort of thing. So that will be really useful as well. Um, improving our knowledge, setting up cameras, training landholders and community how to use, using machine learning software. So we've had a few workshops on this. We've, we've bought 10 cameras. We've trialled them using a software called Evorta, which is state-of-the-art software, and to date, I think there's only one group in KI that's using it apart from us. But it's very sophisticated, and it will recognise creatures. 
and you can then use machine learning to get better at the recognition. So if it says this is a fox, you think no, that's actually a dog. You can teach it, and you can change that no dog, whatever, and it will learn. Um, and the other thing it does, if anyone's used cameras before, wildlife cameras, you will get 2,000 images for the day captured of things that have moved past the camera that have triggered it. You'll be sorting through that, that branch moving in the wind, branch moving in the wind, branch moving in the wind. There's a mouse or something, branch moving in the wind, there's a dog, etc. This one, instead of sending you 2,000 photos, it'll send you 25 of the things that's actually captured. It won't be sending you the leaves moving in the wind, stuff like that. And you can monitor it straight from your computer. You can log in you know, in real time and see what the camera's looking at. So it's really good for landholders. And they can, you know, the data can be sent to them. They don't have to go down and take a card out of the camera and bring it back and put it in their computer. Just what Did they start to... using that after the fires on Kangaroo Island? I think I, think I heard that. Okay. Yeah. 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 But the, uh, you, the, the camera and the software are separate. So you pay, buy your camera, it might be 500 bucks or whatever. The software, you pay a license fee and it's not cheap. It's five or six hundred dollars a year per camera. Yeah. So it costs some money. So we've We've got five licenses at the moment. We've just decided to spend some money and buy another five, so we, yeah. each of the cameras can operate on that. And future budget items, when we get chances for grants and things, will probably some will be cameras, so we can get more cameras out there. So we've had various workshops. We had one down at <coughs> Stipaturas Conservation Park. Does anyone know that? Down south, yeah, a couple of you have been there. Which is which is the Flurio, part of the Flurio swamps. So that's where we've got some groups interested down there, and about where to put your camera, what angle to have it at, how long do you need to leave it in this place, do you actually need to put it in different places around the same area, those sorts of things, how to set it up, how the software works. Don't want those up to as well and went into Belia. That's hard to see, it looks like an elongated photograph, but it's a bandicoot in the middle of the photo there. And this looks like something that is sent to you by eWater. And I don't pretend to understand, but I will one day. <laughs> um, various photos. And you have to, the thing is, if you're crawling through photos looking for something that's there and you don't know there's something there or not, it's pretty tiring. You can miss something. With these, you can see that sometimes it is hard to see something. If it's a you know, night vision, is black and white. One in there, that's not too bad to see, but you know, there's one hiding in there half in the foliage, mm -hmm. it's going to be hard to spot. So, the eGore software is really handy for that. This one here is not that easy to spot on the log without the circle to guide you, the others are a bit clearer. Mm -hmm. uh, there's some other things, oh, you can love the kangaroo down the bottom. And a couple of uh, brea fox on the right, kangaroo, rabbit, deer. Big, big deer problems in the hills these days, unfortunately. And things like deer and kangaroos, through overabundance, they tend to destroy the lower habitat a bit. You know, they bash things over and create open space. Restoration weed management. These, these are, I think these are from Scott Creek. You see the top one there, there's an understory of blackberry, really thick underneath native vegetation. There's a pine tree in the middle there as well. And i just try to look at these others. Bracken, bracken fern in the bottom one. Now bracken fern is really good habitat for bandicoots. Uh, I don't know anybody has had much experience with it, but it'll, if it sits there and it just doesn't get slashed or anything like that, or it'll, seasonally it'll sort of brown off and fall over. And you end up with a thatchy layer about that thick on the ground. Really good for small creatures to scurry through and not get caught. So that's, that's one of our great natural things to help protect. Um, but over on the right hand side, that's, we'd call that suitable bandicoot habitat as well. A mixture of bracken and other things, but it's dense and a small creature can, can really get away from a fox or a cat in that. Do you have uh, prickly acacia? Yes, Acacia paradoxa. Yeah. It's probably the one. Kangaroo thorn, it gets called sometimes. That's a really good habitat plant as well. But it, it'll get big and up off the ground, then as it gets older it gets it falls over onto the ground and then it's really good as well. So when it's small and when it's older it's good. 
In between, it's not providing much density on the ground, but it's part of the picture, and it's really good for birds. Yeah. Small birds love it. I used to live yeah. on Kangaroo Island, and the blue wrens and robin red breasts yeah. used to love living in it. It's really, yeah, it's one of the go-to plants for small birds, I think. So I was wondering why you were planting that back in the earlier photos with the blackberry. Yes. To replace the blackberry, I was Yeah, thinking. I think it's, it's one of them. Um, we want things that are really dense down at that low level as well, so it's really the answer is a mixture of things. Mm -hmm. Too many big things will also shade the smaller stuff and they won't be as bushy. Mm -hmm. They'll be a bit more elongated or they won't survive as well. So it's a bit of a fine art, I think. I'm not an expert in it yet, but that's one of the things with that um, the, yeah, the bottom left-hand corner where we're doing that revegetation, where we really we're planning to get together with the ecologists from the Lewis and Fleurio Landscape Board and nut out a plan for how to manage that. And that, well, I think, we'll be putting in some more bigger things, but also targeting what we do with the smaller things. And, and my guess is retaining some of the blackberry where there's not much native. And where the blackberries intermingled with natives, maybe gradually taking out the blackberry and allowing the natives to come back. Um, sedges and rushes and things like that are really good habitat as well. They generally thicken up fairly well by themselves. Now that's probably too small to read, but this is something we've done on a number of properties. The one there with the in the middle photo with the blue outlines is a big property at Upper Sturt near the Upper Sturt Deli, if people know where that is, in the CFS. Um, Deli and CFS up here on Upper Sturt Road, the layers over there. This is sort of cleared agricultural land, not really used for anything at the moment. This is all bushland and the Sturt River's down here. So we've got bandicoots up there, bandicoots down there. We've probably got some bandicoots in here, but we're still trying to work that out. Uh, so the people from Nature Conservation Society have come through there and done an assessment of that bushland, what condition it's in, whether the habitat's good for bandicoots, if they could see any signs of bandicoots, uh, and, prior, and they sort of prioritise, okay, you know, out of 10 or whatever, losing these various criteria, how important is that we do some work on this property and in what areas would we do it in. They've done that on a whole number of properties and as a result of that they have a report which is on the left which they give to the landholders. The landholders then got a really good report of what they've got on their property, what the priorities might be, what things, you know, if they're in a position to fund some work or to do some work themselves, what might be done. So that, that's, a, that's part of what it says up top there, engaging and mobilising community. Workshops and field days. So on the right hand side is that Stipaturus Conservation Park. And uh, anyone guess what's in that tub that they're looking at there? You wouldn't know probably, but it's uh, scats or poos or different animals. <laughs> so now that's, the, that's what a deer poo looks like. That's a kangaroo. This one's a bandicoot or whatever. A sheep or something. Have they found bandicoots in that national park? Uh, yes, they've got bandicoots in They've also got rats that make tunnels just sort of where the top of the tunnel just about hits the ground. So you walk and you fall into the tunnel. And it's similar, bandicoots can do a similar thing sometimes, so it's a bit tricky working out what's going on. But yeah, they do have them down there. On the left is Blair National Park going for a walk to talk about, or we're going down to Patches of Blackberries to have a look at bandicoot habitat. We did find some diggings on that day. In the middle is the guy giving the talk who's sitting down with his hands out with the curly hair. That's Luke Price, who's the ecologist with the Hills of Fleurio Landscape Board. And that was that, we had that in the hall first and then we went for the walk. So that's, a, that's on that day. Some people stayed in the hall to look at cameras and how they worked. Some people went for the walk to look at habitat and weed management issues. And the one down at Stipaturas on the right, we went, looked, walked through the bush and looked at damage by deer and roos and so on, looked at fencing and the damage to fencing and what that indicated for what sort of animal it was. Uh, we looked at various bits of habitat and, and what condition it was in. Looked at all those rat tunnels. Now this is a Victorian slide. Does anybody can see the uh, stripe on the bandicoot on the right hand side? And I can tell they had a, they, they were a bit, I don't know whether it's skinnier looking or something. Not quite as rounded and <coughs> chumpy. <laughs> and a bit pointier nose perhaps as well. So that's Translocation, as we're saying, is something that we're going to be doing. Um, 
Daniel Beck, there's my number and Beck's number and email addresses up there. But we've got we've got this fair bit of scope for people to get involved as well if if you know anybody or yourself might be interested as well in, with the citizen science things, with working bees, all sorts of publicity, talks, there's all sorts of things that we need to organise and do, but it's good. Particularly if you know anybody that lives in the sort of areas where bandicoots are. And um, I will look for that. The other thing is, Set Up Reaches Lanky Group have got a web page and a Facebook page. They're both easy to find. You just Google Set Up Reaches and Facebook or website or whatever, and you'll find them easily. They'll have links as well. Facebook page is really quite good. And if you guys want to post anything on it, you're very welcome. We're always after interesting content. So if you've got an interesting butterfly or a story about a butterfly or something like that, very happy to have that on the Facebook page. Do you have a Facebook page that you have a convener for? Yeah. Yes. So. Yep. Yeah? Yeah. Cool. All right, maybe we should talk afterwards. So yeah. how far down the Sturt River are bandicoots? That's a good question. They're certainly down... So the top you've got, I think I said before, uh, Certainly in Crafers, Crafers West, Iron Bank, Upper Sturt, definitely. Then for Upper Sturt, you've got, I think it's Coromandel East, is it? Coromandel something. And Hawthorne Dean and Glenalta. So they're in Belair National Park, and that, that comes down that far. Across the other side of the road, they're certainly there as well. And I think that's probably technically Hawthorne Dean. So they certainly come down to there. Once you start getting dense housing, they will peter out. But you know, they might still find a few for a few blocks you know, in people's backyards and things. But, um, but historically, how far would have they gone down? Good down question. Darlington? Yeah, look, I'd suspect they would have been all over the plains. Yeah, in, in certainly in the fertile areas. But, you know, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, well, I'm just trying to think. Where's the Onkaparinga go? That's so it, sort of, yeah, it sort of drops down off um, Scott Creek, I guess. Yeah, so Scott Creek area, certainly, yeah. The northern areas, like the upper parts of the Torrens, I think there's been some records there in the past, but I don't know of current records. There isn't any sort of confirmed sightings for a while. But people have said, I you know, gave a talk to the Tor upper Torrens Land, or no, it's a mid Torrens Lanky group, and they said, oh yeah, I've seen them crossing the road. So there's some you know, anecdotal it's evidence. It's very dense down there. Yeah, likely, yeah I, I would think it's very likely. Yeah. But the, uh, maybe on one of those maps back further, we might be able to pick. Oh, that one. Danny, you're talking about permits for different things? Permits. Yep. Um, at a talk recently, they were talking about the um, platforms they're building for the ospreys around the coast. Sorry, platform for ospreys. Ospreys, oh yes. Took, they thought it'd take a few months to get a few permits and things. Yeah. Eighteen months. Yeah. And a lot of work. Yeah, I, I'm surprised at how long that takes too, but it obviously does. So. Yeah, and they, even for putting, putting up cameras to film them, you need to get a permit. Yeah. yeah. To show you have to basically demonstrate that you're not interfering with them in some way, so that it's a passive exercise. I mean, it's a pretty much a given when you're putting up a camera, it's a passive exercise. But um, I guess it's good that, you know, the government is keeping an eye on things and making sure that people don't do something that's adverse to the native creatures, but adverse, rather. Yeah, so on the Paringa, I'm not sure where that is. I should know better. But if it's, if it's anywhere near Scott Creek, that'll be def definitely yes. So. Yeah. Danny, how much involvement does the department have with what you do? A fair bit, really. A fair bit, but it's really... Um, I have to say, in the I've been doing bush care since about 2000, um, and this since 2012, and all that time, all the people I've dealt with in the department, I've been very impressed with. It's a bit like talking to you guys. You feel like you're talking to somebody who's got a genuine interest in in the environment and wants to do something about it, you almost forget that they're government, apart from the fact that they can pull a few strings. So the people, the colleges and the district officers and land care officers, um, they're, they're all really good. Yeah. So, so well, I really like working with them. But is there any two-way? Like, there's a lot of information going from you to the department. 
Yeah, there's it's quite a, there's, there's quite a bit, and there's, there's their, from their initiative rather than yours. I yeah, like I mean, I think historically, you know, start, I think one of the big things that happened to start off with is that they would help point out to us when funding was available for various things, mm -hmm. and say this might really suit your project. You'd need to do, tailor it this way and that way. So give us advice on applications and so on, and help us get that. They funded those um, flora and fauna surveys on those red properties. Um, we, they would come to our meetings and brainstorm with us how, you know, what we could do to keep the project going or to get it happening in a certain direction. So yeah, they've been very good. And, and now they'll, if we, if we say, you know, for example, you know, we need a planting day, we need a planting day, they'll say, well, how about this? We can provide the fencing or that sort of thing. So it's very collaborative, yeah. I've been very impressed. And they, they really like the project. I think it's something they, they think their department should be doing. It doesn't have the funding to do it by itself, and this project's enabled that funding to come forward and for them to be involved in it. So, yeah. yeah. Is anything being done about the roads that are obviously dividing yes. population from population? It's a really good question. And some yeah. of those roads, they're not just roads, they're what I call transors. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, we and a quarter of a million wouldn't go very far to providing bridges or. Yes, and it's, we've, we've had an article in a paper that big head on that wasn't going to be super highway, it was Tunnel of Love. I mean, it would be. It would <laughs> and that was, you know, and had a couple of people's pictures looking through the tunnel. You know. um, and that was because we, someone, we had a story about something, and they hijacked the story of the Tunnel Love thing because I made the offhand comment that I noticed, we talked about putting a tunnel under the road. Yeah, so. I've noticed on the um, outlet, on the southern outlet, that um, you've got scramble sections for the kangaroos. Yeah. No, sorry for the koalas, koalas because yeah. koalas yeah. are sacred, they're fluffy and cute. Yeah. Yes. I get yes. that. Yes. And then you get um, interesting human interest stories about bear grills that got stuck yeah. into some woman's radiator and stayed there for weeks. But there doesn't seem to be any attention being it's paid been, to it's, the It's been things. on our radar before. Yeah. We've sort of got to turn our attention to it again, I think. One of the big, one of the main roads for crossing over and about getting, getting killed was, up, was up Sturt Road was a big issue, but mm -hmm. there hasn't been found pits killed on that for a long time, and I think it's because there's a chicken wire fence on the edge of Belair there, yeah. which is one reason yeah. why they're not into breeding. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. no brainer, take the chicken wire off, but it's maybe it's not as simple as that because that's stopping rabbits getting mm -hmm. through, it's probably stopping foxes getting through. Then you've got other problems if you know rabbit numbers increase or fox numbers increase, and we've found that out when we've been talking about doing things about foxes. Well, you've got to think about what happens if you start doing things about foxes. Other foxes move in, um, and what's the other thing? You know, rabbit populations increase, and then they eat all your good native vegetation and your rare orchids and things like that, or plants that feed butterflies. Or so you've really got to have a proper, considered approach, and with some science behind it. And, and it's got to be on some sort of scale, and it's got to have some longevity to it, it's got to be funded and properly managed. So, um, a tunnel under the road is a bit simpler, I think, than what I'm talking about with foxes. But we, we've talked about it early in the piece, and it, then it sort of dropped off. I'm not really sure why. But we got caught up in other still things. A lot of money. Yeah, Adelaide Hills Council at that time volunteered to put a trench through the road and drop a pipe into it. But you have to really, the other thing is you have to work out. Is it in the spot where they're going to use it? Yeah. What's to stop Brea Fox from sitting at the other end and waiting for dinner to pop out? <laughs> um, we're aware of the bandicoots. Where, what are you, where are you funneling them to? All that sort of stuff. Yeah, that's not too hard. But, um, and there's been a lot of proven instances of animals using bridges and tunnels before. So you'd like to think that's a, a nice, easy option. And it's a good option from a publicity point of view because you know, it's an, an interest story. People like that sort of idea. I'm sorry, but I'll have you to bring this out. to it. Yep. No, it's, I, yep. I don't think we've got COVID rules, and so we've got to be out by 8 o'clock, which is what used to be. Yep. So we'll take a chance on if you've got some impressing questions of Danny afterwards. You're stopping for a cup of coffee? Yeah, I'll stop for a cup. Yeah. And thank I you to the people that brought the food along. Mm -hmm. I, I got a number of things out of that talk. Other other than bandicoots, I guess. You are definitely a can-do group. Yeah. 
and I think that's really, really important for whatever. I think I think that's one of the strengths of this group. Yes. Yeah. And what's what impressed me when I went to that first meeting and I told them about this way they should be looking out for. They were doing all these things. Yeah. Like, this is a group that does stuff. Yeah. And, it's good, so, yeah. and and the other thing was you didn't mention trying to get back to pristine bushland, mm -hmm. which I I get the info at point of insects. Uh, and people want to just grow natives and they mm -hmm. and natives means Western Australian plants to their, to them mm -hmm. and they they don't they're not trying to save the butterflies because they're not growing the right food mm -hmm. for them. Even if if you're concentrating on the butterflies, then who's, who cares if the plant that they're feeding on is a, an exotic plant because they're adaptive. Mm -hmm. We've wiped out the common the common uh, food plant, mm -hmm. and we'll, we'll, it's like the blackberry yeah. story. Really. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're very conscious of all the plants. We're well, yeah. usually local provenance and yeah. considering yeah. plants of birds, plants of butterflies, all that sort of thing yeah. as well, where we can. So, yeah. Just as a remembrance oh. of us, I'd like to give you, oh, thank you very much. one of our books. That will be very useful. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. No worries.